This week on Silver Screen Queens, we cover Midsummer. Christian and Danny, a young American couple, are having trouble with their relationship after Danny suffers from a severe personal tragedy. The couple decides to go on a vacation to rural Sweden with their friends, Mark and Josh, to visit a small village that is hosting a festival held once every 90 years. Unbeknownst to them, the festivities include violent and disturbing pagan rituals, and the locals insist that they should join in. This is one of your hosts, Stephanie. I'm here today to give you a trigger warning for this episode of Silver Scream Queens. Midsummer deals with a lot of really intense issues, including suicide. If you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide, please reach out to them, let them know there are resources at their disposal, and most importantly, let them know you care. Again, if suicide is a trigger for you, please don't listen to this episode. And instead, stay tuned for any of our other fabulous B-rated horror movie gore fiesta films that we will cover. We love you. All right, witches, strap in, because if you haven't put this together yet, this movie is about to get spoiled. So get ready. I'm Emily. Hi. Um, And today, my cat, who, like, for the last four years has been 14, every time we do the math, Mm -hmm. um, projectile vomited all over our love seat. So I've been getting to deal with that. I'm Stephanie. After watching this movie, I tried to take a walk to walk it off, and I couldn't. So here we are. (laughs) I am Blaine, and this week, I came up with a drinking game for our own podcast. (gasps) Drink whenever one of us says ma'am. Drink whenever Stephanie does her laugh. It's ha ha ha. (laughs) (laughs) Drink whenever Emily says, but it has to scare me. (laughs) Yes. Or yeet. Yeet. Yes. Or yeet. Drink whenever I say hello. Yeah. Drink whenever we swear. Whenever the Bechdel test is mentioned. Oh, yes. That's a good one. Or whenever a soft orgy is mentioned. Boy, that is brilliant and epic, and I think it's a fabulous idea. And I will take part in it this eve. Cheers, Cheers. babies. Every movie that that is picked, I believe Blaine handpicked in her deep thoughts for us to (laughs) watch. So this was one that I handpicked um, specifically for this date because of Midsummer. The the other ones are randomly picked unless it's like Halloween. Then I pick one of the Halloween ones or um, Friday the 13th. When I watched this movie, I know it's relatively new. And like, what a follow up to Hereditary. I know. So... I love the fact that this was supposed to be Ari Aster's first horror movie because Hereditary was actually supposed to be a family drama. And then it kind of spiraled out of the muck. But you can really see that story throughout Hereditary. And I think that this movie obviously started as a tale of emotion and a breakup story. Well, yeah, Um, and grief. And yeah. Grief and just allowing, and I mean, we'll get into it, but allowing yourself to feel in general. Yes. I think in the in the two movies that we've seen from him, Ari Aster really does a great job of graying the line between drama and horror. Yes. Because at any given point in this movie, even during the most horrific aspects, this could be a drama through and through. I like to try and compare it to um, the Sinner series. He did a lot of digging on so many different subjects to come up with the things that he put in this movie. He's also obsessed with The Shining, which we'll talk about as we go oh, through. Oh, yeah. Yes. Really, really cool shots. And just like Hereditary, one minute you're like, okay, weird thing going on. To the next minute you're like, you are you are not the same. So remarkable, the amount yeah. of care that went into every detail of this movie. And even yes. just the actual, if you're looking at the actual set of this fucking movie and the way fucking that- crazy. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. This is my third time watching this movie, I wow. think. Every single time I've watched it, there is yet another creepy thing I've picked up on. It's not oh, just like, oh, God. I didn't know that. notice it this the last time. It's, right. oh my God, that is so fucking scary. Right. Um, yeah. It was crazy. We can say going into this that it's a, it's an experience, at yeah. least. It's Go not with- for the faint of heart. <laughs> no. Yeah, no. The opening intro scene. Be- beautiful subtlety here that it starts on a very cold winter scene. Yes. So you're starting a movie called Midsummer with ice and a clear fear and the tapestry. Shit, I'm even skipping the tapestry. The tapestry so, itself, like, is a 
a precursor to the entire movie. That tapestry on your second watch, pause and appreciate it. On your first watch, don't try. It's not worth it to to try to to translate something that you don't know the Rosetta Stone for yet, basically. And the artist who actually created this did a, li- a limited run of them a little while ago. Um, so there are people who own this tapestry in their homes, which is incredible. So we open on Danny, uh, played by Florence Pugh. Pugh. I have no idea. We're jolted by a ringing phone. Um, and we can tell it's a landline. And then it cuts to an answering machine. And then we hear Florence Pugh's voice talking to her parents, asking, hey, um, what's up with my sister? Like, I feel like, you know, I got some weird emails from her and I feel like maybe you guys fought. I just want to make sure everybody's okay. And then we cut to her parents in bed, face up, and we're to assume that they're sleeping. The number nine in this movie is really important. The iterations of seasons of life are all multiples of nine. Midsummer occurs every 90 years. As she's leaving a voicemail for her parents, the camera pans away from the voicemail as it hits the number nine, which is just like a nice little nod. The wallpaper in their room is extraordinary ordinarily floral there's yellow flowers and there's also a photo on the mother's nightstand of danny with a flower crown on it we see florence danny is her name in the film uh in her apartment and she hangs up the phone and then she goes through who is she going to call next because she needs to be talking to someone um and she calls her boyfriend christian Never met anyone named Christian who isn't a asshole. Yes. It's like a Chad. She calls Christian and he picks up and she's like, so are we still hanging out tonight? And he's like, were we supposed to hang out tonight? And basically that's all I need to hear. Like to know that guy was a piece of shit because he was reluctant the entire time. And she's like, yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to come over, like that would be great. And he's like, um, yeah, I think I can make that work. We also know for a fact that they did have plans because you see her email and he confirms plan with her for tonight in her email. You can tell her eyes are welling. She's in so much pain. Something's really wrong. About her sister who ends up being bipolar. And like she's talking about the weird email she got from her sister that makes her think something bad happened. And how she hasn't, her sister hasn't been responding since she left those weird emails. And he's like, well, you know, you do this. Like you give her the attention she wants. And then she like, he, she rides off of that. Making it seem like it's her fault. What? Yep. And she's like, well, she's bipolar. So I worry about her. And, like, he's like, well, you know, you're just giving her the attention she wants and, and you know, you need to stop. That's that's not okay to do. And, like, <laughs> not validating her feelings at all. Not giving her any, like, room to feel her feelings. He's just piling it on her. Well, and he even reluctantly asks about Terry, her sister. He's like, how's the thing with your sister? And she's like, actually horrible. And he's like, it's probably your fault, idiot. And then we span to her after this. She's taking out a van, talking to her girlfriend about this whole situation. About And she is so worried that she is overburdening Christian with her problems. And the girl friend is is incredibly correct when she's like, oh no. My God. She's like how we would be if like, yes. we were talking to Lauren. Like, We'd be like, then dump him. Like, yeah, either I, talk to him or just leave him at the curb, you know? Right, Fuck yep. this guy. He should want to be with you and talk to you and console you. My first watch of the movie, I'm like, okay, maybe they've been together for, like, a week. And this is, like, right? them building a relationship. Four years. Four yeah. fucking years. Four years, we learn. The worst part is we switch to him with his friends. And the one friend is the uh, kid that was from Meet the Millers. Mm-hmm. Yes. He was also in that, like, Choose Your Own Adventure Black Mirror episode. He is always the clown, which we'll come into later, but he has his friends there, Pele, Josh, Meet the Millers, whose name is, what's his Mark. name? Mark. Mark. And uh, that's it, right? We got Mark, Pele, and Josh. Christian already looks like a huge douchebag. I don't know what about a white man named Christian makes him look like a douchebag, but he already it's looks like neck a beard. It's yeah. his neck beard. It's his eyes are a little too close together. It's, it's the jawline. It's the forehead. Like, he's got that Neanderthal look really Dude, down pat. Paul and Jost. Yes. Basically, he's talking to his friends about how she is just bothering him. And you already establish a a serious dislike for his friend Mark because he says, well, you need to just break up with her and find a girl who actually likes sex. 
the only friend that you actually begin to like in this situation, Pele, is quite quiet. But Josh yeah. said, maybe you're using this as an excuse to put off your thesis. He's like, what do you mean? And he's very defensive about this. And then she calls him back. And the friend Mark is like, oh my god, this is abuse. And I was yeah. just like, wow, bro. <laughs> Livid. <laughs> Pell does mention while they're like, you should break up with her. Pell was like, think of all the Swedish girls you could impregnate when we're oh. there next er, next oh. month. It's what uh, my husband and I, we like to sing these words, foreshadowing. And so- <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And she calls and she is just like in inhumanly Wailing. Her sobbing is so heart-wrenching. Like I felt gutted just listening yep. to her like what a masterful performance in yeah. just oh, in fake incredible. crying fantastic so we cut to him hesitantly approaching her apartment and then finally we see that he is cradling her and she is inconsolably sobbing and screaming no oh my god i don't know that i've seen a better performance since trigger warning this is yeah. really tough so please skip this scene if you struggle because it is a really really tough view of suicide all of a sudden really sharp music there's horns blaring we are at the parents house and we see their cars their exhaust pipes are duct taped to some pipes uh and those lead up to the bedroom and we see the sister with a, we see the parents in their beds and it's the same shot we saw from before, but now we are presuming they're dead from um, from the smoke inhalation and the, the carbon monoxide poisoning. Basically the sister has the hose duct taped to her mouth and her eyes are fucking open and it's creepy as fuck. And so at this point you're basically led to believe also when you go back to those emails, the sister says mom and dad are coming to or something to that Ugh. effect. And you're led Ugh. to basically believe that the either the sister at this point i was under the impression the sister took the parents through her actions and they were sleeping at the time yeah i mean i think i think that's what you're led to to believe because you see the duct tape at the bottom of the outside of the parents doors with the hose from the exhaust leading in there and then she obviously has a duct tape on her face danny's character knows that this is you know where whereas christian's making light of it and she's like she's just attention seeking that is the ultimate like toxic behavior to have towards yes has any issues at all you know she is worried because she is aware of the nature of her sister's illness well and there's there's a pretty big fan theory that in the first scene when she's leaving the message while you're panning over the parents you can kind of see the mom's chest lift and fall there's the assumption that she's alive and that if they would have answered the phone they could have survived yeah. it's just it just adds to the layers of heartbreak that danny's experiencing she Fuck has her. the worst support system now that her oh. family is gone now where he was going to possibly break up with her it's that bullshit thing of like now he's stuck in it well i can't know oh, yeah know. like it's her fault that he it, can't break up with her she has a lot of really beautiful plants in her apartment that are flourishing <laughs> And uh-huh. within the next three scenes, you see them die yeah, because she stopped caring for them, which is so... And also she has a spider plant, which is like impossible to kill. So your girl really is neglecting them. So this movie was actually supposed to be three hours and then it got an NC-17 rating. So they had to cut more some of the more gruesome scenes just for content, not for time. So it wasn't at the discretion of like, let's sit this in two hours. It was like, oh, I guess we'll cut some more dead faces so at the very next scene you don't really know how much time has passed but danny's waking up from sleep he was like i'm gonna go to a party just for like 45 minutes as if like i've been cooped up with you all day and i need to get out and i don't want you to come and she was like no no no, i can come and he was like uh did she get enough sleep as if to say like (laughs) nothing really go back the fuck to bed continue being depressed i don't want anything to do with you can we also talk about the beautiful painting above her bed so it's the large bear and then a young lady like she's maybe like 10 and she has a crown and she's eye to eye with a bear and that painting was actually painted by a swedish artist who specifically paints folklore i think his name is actually ragnar person so we cut to the party and she's not even really there mentally. She's like zoning out and whatever. And then she hones in on the conversation finally. And just to pick up the fact that one of the people in the conversation says, so you guys are going to Sweden. Then she realizes Christian and his group of friends, Josh, Mark, and Pele, 
are planning to go to Sweden in two weeks. <laughs> and He's like, we're just talking about it. Yeah, Christian's like, we're just talking about it. It might be, you know, mid-June, mid-July. And they're like, no, 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 in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yep. and imagine, just imagine now, granted, there are so many different kinds of relationships where people don't get married and they just stay together and it's fine. But four years into a relationship, you're on a track. So if you're not, right. what the fuck are you doing? And she is obviously irked and he makes her so uncomfortable that scene is i felt <gasps> as a person that's been to awkward parties first of all this party someone has been gang raped in this home for sure oh, yes God. second he just makes her so uncomfortable and yeah. um the one the one josh who studies anthropology he says it's also to help him study the tradition of midsummer but then like it grows into this even more awkward scene where more attention is drawn to the fact that christian didn't talk to danny about this and all danny is asking is like oh yeah i didn't i didn't know and christian makes it worse by trying to come up with lies that are clearly lies to everybody else because mm -hmm. everybody else is like no 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 we're we're going. Like, you have a ticket. This is happening. Why are you lying? And then somehow she ends up apologizing. Oh my god. I oh, hate this so oh, wait, much. Wait, can I just say though, she does remind me, he reminds me of Gilly, where he's she's like, Gilly, and he's Gilly. like, Gilly. <laughs> 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 so, the apologizing is the worst. Oh, it's, it's the worst. And also, oh. I just want to take a hot second too and appreciate the costuming here. The fact, like, she is wearing a depression uniform. Yes. Yes. It, she wears she's like in, what we're all wearing in the yep. pandemic right now. She's wearing like black sweats or like legging pants and then an oversized shirt. And it's an interesting note, again, props to this film for the detail that before they get to. Uh, like really into the culture with, that they're about to experience. She doesn't own a piece of like form fitting clothing. She's literally not fitting into her own surroundings in yeah. her own home, which is just such a, again, such a good detail. He's apologizing and she has one sentence that's she, great. And that I'm like, well, baby, you're getting not it. apologizing though. He, he's just like, well, sorry. Yes. And she's like, that didn't sound like sorry. That sounds like too bad. And I was like, yeah. yes, bitch. That's yeah. the attitude I want to see. And then he's like, well, then I'll leave, like threatens her to leave alone when she's obviously not in a good place. And, and then she starts profusely we, apologizing to him. And also, we don't even know how long it's been since her whole fucking family died. Right. Yep. So what? we can assume, so it was snowing when they found the bodies. Right. So we can assume that it's at least been three months, which yeah. I don't know about you, but if my entire family died, I would need, yep. what, th 38 years? Christian goes to his friend's apartment. I believe this is Josh's apartment. His friends are talking about what they're going to do in Sweden. And Mark says, do they have like meatball sex clubs, which is the only club I want, right? <laughs> it's also like mildly racist to ask your Swedish friend. Right. Like they're an Ikea sex club. Like, And Pele seems very sweet at this point. Christian comes in and he's like, hey, um, I had to invite her. And you guys, basically, he's like, she's not going to come, but I had to invite her. And you guys told me you wanted her to come also. And then immediately, like, she knocks on the door and she comes in. Betting on her depression, by the way. That's what he's doing. So I invited her without talking to you guys. No big, sure. no big. This confirms that he is both a bad boyfriend and a bad friend in general. Yes, really rooting for his death at this point. He is like a fucking York peppermint patty of a friend. He sucks all the way oh. through. You know the only thing I like about a peppermint patty? If you put a peppermint patty really close to your ear and you break it in half, it makes the most satisfying sound in the whole world. What? And it's just beautiful. It, the way a peppermint patty breaks, it's just like... If we ever become famous and we make t-shirts related to the podcast, the first one is going to be a fucking peppermint patty and it's going to say it's <laughs> the sweetest sounds. It, it, <laughs> that should be their whole fucking marketing campaign because it's not a good candy. So they should sell it as an ASMR technique. So Pele is the resident Swede and he knows the traditions and he knows what's up. Mark and Christian go in the other room. He is showing Danny the runic alphabet and he, he showed her a photo of that year's may queen and he look at mm. he looks at her and this is going to play into our theory later because i think we have the same exact theory yeah. he says i'm so glad you're coming and yep. he says more than anybody else i'm so glad you're coming 
that point he starts to say, hey, also my parents, you know, I lost my parents uh, when I was young and two, this is too fresh. Um, so she's yeah. very um, caught off guard and she's like, it's okay. It's okay. He's like, I'm so sorry. And she's like, I need to go to the bathroom. And this shot is very much, you know, if you've seen Hereditary, the way that it's shot is very much the way the shining was shot with all these kind of mm -hmm. like transitional very upside down weird pans and she goes into his bathroom and that immediately becomes the airplane bathroom on their way yeah. to sweden so they're on the airplane and she's clearly still having like panic attacks and she's... she is deeply grieving still and it's being completely unacknowledged by the people in her life and also to imagine that at this point she is clinging on to the only thing she knows which is this guy and you know she knows yeah. him every snarky bullshit thing he says she fucking knows so also on the plane is where we get our first easter egg oh so while we're on the plane danny looks out the window 23 minutes and 44 seconds in if you look in the bottom right or bottom left hand corner of the window you can see the silhouette of her sister with a hose in her mouth in the clouds god damn it i love what you. yes so her well, eyes and are that's throughout the movie like you yes. you will catch a it lot. at various times in unexpected Holy. places we turn to, they are quickly in Sweden. They are in the car, this very Swedish car, and they're driving. And we've established that Mark is a resident dumb bitch. They're driving, and then they see the, you know, just fucking hot Swedish women. And he's like, oh man, are all Swedish women like this? And then Josh makes a remark that said the Vikings would steal mm -hmm. the best looking women from each, like, of their, they would steal the women, so they actually have these, like, basically chosen bred women which is interesting mm -hmm. so i will say that aside from pele josh is my favorite oh absolutely so like they're driving and they pass this sign that announces that they're entering the place where swedish community is located awesome beautiful shining reference shot oh my god and yeah. there's that upside down view not yeah. only to indicate yes they're in a foreign place they're in a you know different customs and everything you're going to happen here to to kind of make you feel out of sorts or uh, like you don't belong but it's also a reference to the shining as well and it's a very bright vibrant greeting sign but underneath it it says stop mass immigration to this was it county country i think that feeds in heavily into the idea of purity that it's going to be a really constant yes. trend as a side note, it's actually Ari Aster's political reference in this film is in relation to the rise of the white supremacy movement in Sweden. It's a very white, very pure, yeah. quote unquote, breed of people. And um, since the rise of, uh, you know, we're a fifth president, they've had a really heavy rise in, in the amount of um, white supremacy in Sweden. They go and they stop and there's a, a giant field full of strange children. We get introduced to Simon and Connie, which is like a lovely, cute little couple from London, yes. who Pele's brother... Ingemar. Ingemar? I'm going to say it wrong the whole time, so get ready for that. <laughs> they meet Simon and Connie, who are also brought in from the outside by Ingemar, so you get the idea that it's not just them being brought in, which is what you're kind of led to believe, which is interesting. And some people are in this like ritualistic clothing that's all white... At this point, their clothing is almost entirely white. As the film progresses, more red starts to be introduced to their costumes. But right now, it's mm -hmm. mostly white. Enigmar is like, you, get, you got here at the perfect time. We just did shrooms. You guys want in. And then fucking Mark, who's the biggest piece of shit, just like oh. grabs the drugs, which is yeah. so rude. No etiquette. No drug. Et like, don't bogard, you dick. And he's like, <laughs> no, let's... He's like that kid that like was uh, always smokes the joint and never pays in any money. Yeah, you know? like such a piece of like, shit. Like I'm not gonna eat any pizza. I'm not gonna put in money. And then he eats like four oh, slices. Think... So in order to have a good trip, you have to be in a good mindset. I will never do shrooms again. I had a bad trip, and I won't do it again because I think that I'm too anxious <gasps> now. And yeah. I think if I were Dude, to take I them again, do those with you. I mean, I do them with you though. So Danny just had a panic attack on the plane, has to deal with her boyfriend being a piece of shit, is in a new and uncomfortable environment, which is mostly men. So she's probably afraid. And well, she's like, hey, I'm just going to like get my footing first before I take shrooms. And her boyfriend's like, okay, well, I'll wait for you, which seems cute. But then she he tells all of his friends. Hey, I'm waiting for Danny. We should all wait for Danny. It's Danny's yeah. fault we can't have fun right now. It's yep. so awful. And the way that they waffle back and forth and there's this silence. It's like, yep. you guys have your experience. We'll have our experience later. Like, that could have been fine and done. 
But um, I don't know if you guys have ever been in that relationship where he clearly doesn't want anything to do with you. And for some reason, you just really need to be in this relationship right now. And you're hanging on, even though you know this guy's a piece of fucking shit. Well, and, and I also hate the fact that Mark's like, we won't have the same trip. I get the idea that, like, it sucks to be high when everyone else is sober. But you're talking about being high when 85% of the other people are high. Like, if two people don't join your trip, you're, it's not going to ruin it. So eventually, poor Danny is like, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. No, 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 I don't want to make a problem. I don't want to have a problem. And she decides to do it. And Ingemar says, do you want to drink the tea instead? And she does that. Which is so cute. And he's and they're very yeah. nice until it's terrifying. So she drinks the tea against her fucking will. And they begin to trip balls. Can you even imagine your significant other proposing to trip balls when you have lost your whole family and he knows what's up in your brain, one yep. would assume that you would be like, we are going to fucking sit and pick goddamn flowers and I will eat you out for two and a half days. <laughs> yep. They're all tripping balls. Pele, Mark, Josh, Christian, and Danny. And Danny's sitting under a tree. Mark is really the one that's having a hilarious trip because he is just not, he's like, everybody needs to lay down. Can everybody just lay down with me, please? He just wants yeah. everybody with him. It's Josh, his can you just lay down? <laughs> oh, yeah. And the tree, so Danny is breathing, and at first she's okay. And then she looks down, and her hand is actually, um, the grass is growing through her hand. In her trip, the grass is growing through her hand. The tree is looking real trippy. She, she stands up right away. It's almost like she snaps out of it, but you can tell the trip has turned at this point. She's walking. There are people singing, and she sees them, and she thinks they're laughing at her. And she runs past Ingemar, and he says, they're not laughing at you. They were just laughing. She goes to a bathroom. She sees her face. She sees a picture of, like, Jesus in the background or something. No, it's her sister. She, it's see, her she sister. sees her sister. Oh, yeah. she, she sees her sister in the background of the mirror. Then she, uh, the light flickers back on, and she sees her own face, and her own face is very morphed. And then she runs away in fear from there, and you're worried about her. And she then wakes up in a field, and her... Um, in this scene, actually, what I read was intentionally... This is meant to be the beginning of her rebirth because her skin is so bright, it's almost glowing. Like, they used fucking Kim Kardashian oh, wet wow. highlighter on this bit. <laughs> they used Fenty on her. I love it. When they wake up, Christian is waking Danny up, and Danny says, how long was I asleep? And Christian says, like, six hours. And she looks around, and she's like, did it get dark? And Christian says, you know, for a couple hours, um, I guess. All of Christian's friends are waiting on her. Like, I just hate everything about this situation. It's horrible. So Ugh. it's it's the worst. Um, so she joins them and they end up hiking for what feels like several hours. Um, because at one point, you know, Mark makes a fuss and he, you know, is like, how long have we been fucking hiking? And, you know, um, there's a thing about ticks. <laughs> um, yeah, encephalitis. And, like, the the rest of the guys are, like, you know, kidding him and saying, like, oh, my dad died from Lyme. And, you know, things like that. This is the time where I wrote, Q, Blaine hates camping. Yes. <laughs> Ari Aster has a huge fear of insects. So yeah. Mark's fear of ticks this entire time. Also, like, if you notice, he's wearing double socks so he doesn't get yes. bitten. That's actually something that Ari Aster does. They oh, end yeah. up walking through this sun-shaped, beautiful prop studio-looking thing. Gorgeous. And it's like when you land in Hawaii and they give you a lay, but they're playing shitty flutes. This film has very odd audio levels. It'll go from very loud to very quiet. It'll want, it wants to jolt you with sensory experience, yeah. much like drugs. Mark says, so are we stopping in Waco before we go to Pele's village? And the only reason I know that is because I watched it with subtitles. Yes. Ah. And also, <laughs> I love I love that Blaine just did the count. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> this film intentionally left out all foreign subtitles to make you yep. feel manipulated. When this film was shown in Sweden... Instead of being creeped out, every single audience who saw this in Sweden thought this was a black comedy yes. because they were laughing no. the entire time, which is crazy to me. So no. I love it. I love it. 
And like, Let's especially move. with an anthropological angle to this movie, it is so great to see how it was viewed by people who are actually the natives of the intended wow. script. When they get into the village, Pele and Ingemar are like, oh, this is my fucking sister. This is my fucking whatever, whatever. And he says, my sister was born the exact same day as me. And you're like, that's weird. And then there's they meet a, a strange priest. And in the most normal thing that's happened so far, a priest is creepily rubbing a man teenager. And then yeah. um, Father Odd. Father Odd says to everybody, welcome. But to Danny, he says, welcome home. Oh. And, that's and then you pan out and then you see your first rune of the movie. So on the maypole, there's two hoops. And in those hoops are the rune of, it looks like the English letter R. It's rebirth, um, new journeys, and just openness to a new spiritual experience is what that specific rune stands for. You see this rune a lot in this film. And I do want to say that in this opening scene, you're really taken aback by the amount of children just frolicking yes. fields. And this is a world that Hitler would have tremendously enjoyed. He loved it. All a whitewash. Yeah. Did you ever play with a maypole as a kid? We had maypoles. That's that was like a terrible. thing. Which is so you funny because you were raised you basically it. in a Christian cult. Not even basically. When you watch the intro scene of all the people in white walking and then the, the several people that are clearly just tourists, it's like BYO sacrifices, like bring your own sacrifice. Oh, like, yeah. They're passing fucking hors d'oeuvres. It's like a wedding. They're on a stage. Everybody's standing around and they're watching. And this, this older woman, she begins to talk in Swedish and then she switches to English because she's like, oh, how rude of me to our food. I mean, guests. So every 90 years, we have this feast. It lasts nine days. Q to a either, you know, we're assuming special needs disabled at this point person painting furiously. And then she starts to say, and I believe it's in Swedish, but that is translated. It says, this high my fire, no higher, no hotter. And she's handing a torch to several different groups of people. And she shrieks that they have to send their spirits back to the dead. We pan to a girl in a room. And she is a she is a ginge fixing her hair and amping herself up. And she goes out of the door. And that, that door, I believe, the runes are all also the letter R. They're playing a straight <laughs> ring around, bat mitzvah style ring around the rosy. And they're playing a game called Skin the Fool. And I have Ooh. a thing. Um, later on, this game is going to be very important to remember the idea of Skin the Fool. And Mark asks, what game are they playing? And they say, yes, fool. And uh, and then the redheaded girl that we had seen prior kind of kicks Christian in the ass, like, cutely and weirdly. <laughs> and he sort of looks at her, and then he gets up to attempt to join the game. And uh, Pele, then at this point, says, happy birthday. Oh, he has that great line. He has that great line. He uh, says, he's like, you're American. Just shove yourself in there. So he's like, happy birthday. And he hands her this drawing, which is like a stunning drawing of her. And it's her with a flower crown on. And he says, I only do it for birthdays, which becomes really important later. Um, yeah. But she's really touched. And she even says, like, oh, my God, Pele, I'm so touched. And she's like, oh, it's extra sweet because Christian forgot. Oh. And then she goes, it's my fault he forgot. I forgot yep. to remind him. I what? Mark asks after, how does this commune slash cult make money? And he says they have, like, you know, um, lumbery, they make lumber and uh, crafts, and they have a water power plant, like fucking Chernobyl's right down the street, like <laughs> past the sacred yellow temple and they look at it and they say, you're not allowed in there, and then they pass a fucking bear in a cage and Mark says, are we just going to ignore the bear? And Pele says, it's a bear. <laughs> so we pass oh this tapestry God. from right to left which is like hinting to sacred text and it shows a woman who is in love with a man picking flowers and then she dreams of them together and then the next morning she'll, she collects her pubic hair and menstrual blood and feeds it to the man and then it shows her being impregnated and him with like crazy weird spiral eyes showing hypnosis and her pregnant marrying him like in a wedding dress oh so it's god. just like hallmark. purely a spell for love what a hallmark channel movie fuck yeah oh my god then they're taken to where they'll be sleeping they see that the entire interior of basically their building or their hostel, I guess is what it ends up being, is covered in art 
full of folklore that is full of runes as well. And as they're exploring, Danny sees that Pele is taking Christian aside. And Christian's saying, oh my god, like, believe me, like, blah, blah, blah. Danny is interacting with the couple from London, Connie and Simon. Connie and Simon ask Danny how long Danny and Christian have been together. The two of them give completely different answers. Mm. Um, Christian says, was it like three, three and a half years? And Danny's like, uh, four years, four years and two weeks. Yep. And like some odd days, like she knows exactly how long they've been together. And there's just like this awkward silence again because, and it's not Danny's fault. It's not no, no. just because she knows how long she's been with her boyfriend and Christian's an awful person. Danny asks the same of Connie and Simon. And then they, you know, say, well, actually, we just got engaged. And our Swedish friend who brought us here is going to officiate our wedding. And uh, Danny, being a very polite and wonderful person, you know, shows interest and congratulates them. And Christian's only response is to turn away and be like, fuck, like, yep. I don't want to be in this conversation. Like, I don't want to have to talk about having to marry this wonderful person. Like, fuck me. Oh. What, like 30 minutes into the movie and I've already fucking had it with this guy. Pele tells them that there are basically three to four phases of life in this cult. I'm just calling it a cult. 18 to 36 is pilgrimage. 36 to 54 is the fall of your life. That's the work. 18 to 36 is your uh, is your summer. Then mm-hmm. you're 54 to 72, you are a mentor. That's your winter. Then you, at 72, they say, what happens at 72? And he does a slit across the throat motion and nobody takes it seriously. Yeah, it's so fun. <laughs> I can't ha ha ha. Shitty boyfriend Christian is like, let's talk outside. And then Danny like reluctantly goes with him because like they're not good together. Yep. And he lights a piece of bunt cake that I don't know where the yeah. f- well obviously I didn't know where he got it. Pele gave it to him. Pele yes. was, hey, it's her birthday. Here's the candle. Probably Here's a bunch cake. of pubes. You should give it to her. Probably fucking full of pubes. You want my beer. And- he keeps trying to light it, which is a great metaphor, but so he's trying to keep the spark of the candle alive and the spark of the candle and their relationship is dead. And then she's, she like blows out an already unlit candle and she's like, I'm not mad. It's okay. I'm not mad. And he's like, you should be. And she's like, yeah, I should be, but I'm not And also, <laughs> like it's such an honest moment for her that I kind of love. It's her acknowledging past. that she's in a toxic relationship, but still there. And in the background, constantly, as he's, he's just desperately attempting to light this candle that will not light, there is a group of women singing to a baby in unison, swaying, and he's just, he's going between being confused by that, trying to light the candle, it's just a yep. fuck fest, and it's just, it's just a mess, and right before that, the lady named Inga came in and told them the kids are watching Austin Powers, and if everybody wants to come, and this yeah. was actually not in the original film, but it was actually just improvised at the time. Fun fact, Pele tells them that the next day they're going to be celebrating a ritual called a testupan. And nobody knows what it is except Josh, who's a fucking genius. Knows what it is, but he will not tell them. And Christian attempts to Google it, like everything in his life. Like how to please a woman, how to live a life, yes. how to do the serial killer <laughs> He system. never Googled how to please a woman. He's a <laughs> no. Soul. So, um, and then in the night you hear Mark, as they're going to bed, Mark says, yo, check my scalp for ticks and I'll check yours. Right. <laughs> and the baby's crying all night and this is this movie is like children of the corn on acid they wake up there's this very strange yoga dance happening mm-hmm. and they're lining up at the front of the temple the yellow temple that is 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 enter d uh at these tables in the shape of a ruin i'm sure the women are picking up flowers walking backward om shinrikyo like leaders come out of around the area of the temple and they're two people and they're older, and you don't know who they are. At this point, you think they may be, like, elders, and they're important mm-hmm. or something. They come to the table. They sit in these gorgeous West Elm chairs. They wait. We wait. The kid looks at them, and then they sit. Everybody eats as they eat. The elders, at one point, get up, and they make the noise as if a human were a didgeridoo. And for about <laughs> 14 minutes, they take a shot, and then they go off on their fucking Egyptian cruise liner ship on their chairs. <laughs> so we arrive at this summit that has this huge, beautiful cliff. Everyone's gathered, and the Egyptian cruise line has ended, docked, if you will, at the peak of this cliff. So they're at the top, 
and there's a woman at the bottom reading out of their what we what we find out is their religious text josh is like hey um could i read that and he's like absolutely not go fuck yourself this is also another scene where hidden faces are in the background so if you look in the rocks there's a lot of hidden faces and there's the two elderly people and they both cut their hands and then place the blood of their hand on this large stone covered in runes that also includes two of that r rune from earlier danny is having a really hard time it looks like she's having a panic attack she's starting to breathe really heavily um she's looking up at the summit she knows that something bad's about to happen and then the woman from the original couple comes to the end and does this really elegant kind of dance and there's also a man in the crowd with like a huge ass mallet bt dubs mm-hmm. huge ass wooden mallet and you're like mm, what about that for you play black and mole later no and right before she jumps off the cliff, Danny gasps and grabs Christian's arm in fear before it happens. So I think this is a great moment where we see that Danny is really becoming one with the culture and experiencing the pain and emotion that the inhabitants of the village are experiencing rather than the emotions of the people that she came here with. She's also experiencing the empathy that she hasn't gotten thus far. So it's really kind of a breaking point for her as to what exactly is going on here, whether or not she can continue. If you can handle this scene, you're good to go because it is (laughs) easily the most fucked up scene. At this point, you've made the assumption that what Pele was saying was true, that at 72, this is the time when you do this. And then you're, you're, you're clarified moments later. Also, before the, the older woman jumped, she was glaring at Danny. Directly at Danny. I do think that Simon, Connie, ja- um, Christian, and Josh are all ignorant to the mm-hmm. fact that that something big is about to happen i think maybe they think she's gonna sing or do some ritualistic dance or something but i don't think they realize what's really gonna happen danny gasps grabs christian's hand and the woman plummets to her death at the bottom of this this cliff oh so ari aster also has a huge fear of head wounds that's like a thing that really really disturbs him so it's throughout his movies that's like if i literally made a movie about cellulite (laughs) Here comes Grandpa. So also, <laughs> Simon and Connie start freaking the fuck out. Yeah. So everyone's in shock. Well, every outsider, rather, is in shock. Right. And all well, the villagers are like, yeah, this is just what happens. This is fine. Simon starts yelling to the man, you don't have to jump, sir. Please don't jump. You don't have to do it. And like, the man what? plummets, presumably to his death, but he but lands I, on his feet. The minute I watched him jump, I was like, you're doing it wrong. Your form is yep. wrong. Swan dive, bitch. Come no. on. Lands on both of his feet. And he's not quite dead yet. And an interesting fact about this movie, this was one of the most expensive scenes in the film because it's really expensive to get a prosthetic head that includes fake blood. Ooh, so instead yes. of getting one that – getting multiple ones, they actually built a robotics kind of thing nice. that could come together and fall apart with the touch Ooh. of a button. So instead of like re refilming with different fake heads, they use the same one that would come together and fall apart. So he doesn't fall to his death. And this is where we find out where the mallet's for. So well, they play a big old game of whack-a-mole on his head. Four people come up to him. And my thought was, are these people now, uh, I will say right before that, and this is a, th- this is a theme in the rest of the film, this cult, they have a tendency to whenever there is an emotion being had by a member it is represented by the entirety of the group. As he is, he will, he's obviously in pain, this poor man that has jumped and he has now landed on his feet. And everyone begins to shriek and uh, moan as the people walk up to him with the mallet to whack-a-mole his goddamn head. <laughs> My thought was, could that be his actual family doing it for him? Ooh, that's such that, a good point. It totally makes sense that it's his family. By the way, does anyone else notice Josh looks so fucking jazzed? Yes. When he's he's getting a true out of his own culture experience. And as the Brits are flipping their shit, the matriarch explains that they these people have given their life as a gesture. They they see life as a circle rather than the fear of getting old and dying. So Danny walks off by herself after this. Christian tries to like console her and she's like, no, I just need to be by myself. And this is like the famous gif uh, following this movie where she's just like walking and trying to contain herself. And then finally Mm -hmm. she gets behind a building and just breaks the fuck down because what? Like, what the fuck? Like everybody there except for the people she's least close with are 
not freaking out, have are not affected by this, and they just take it as, well, this is just a different culture, and regardless of whether or not it's a different culture, it's a shock to her. We cut to Christian enters the barn where everybody is supposed to sleep, and Josh is already there, and he says, so I just wanted you to know Ugh. that... I'm also doing my thesis on the colony. And Josh is like, that makes so much fucking sense that you're being such a fucking leech. <laughs> and Josh is like, you know, that's why I'm here, right? To do my thesis. Christian doesn't acknowledge any of that. He's just like, I'm doing my thesis on this. Um, you're more than welcome to join me. Well, he's like, we could like, collaborate. And he's like, go fuck yourself. Yeah. We finally see that even Josh's friends know that he's a piece of shit. But I side with Josh. I stand Josh. For he sure. deserves it. Yes. So Danny is packing to leave because she's flipping the fuck out. She wants to go and Pell comes in. And he says, you know, do you want some fucking smelling salt? She's like, yo, y'all, all y'all give us is mushrooms. I don't want that. <laughs> this yeah. is when he has the whole, ha does, does Christian make you feel held? Yes. Moment. This is obviously the moment that we all fall in love with Pele because like, what a sweet baby angel that he's so worried about her. He tells her, this is very important, that his parents had burned up in a fire. So he ooh, understands, ooh, ooh. He begins to flip out and he, he is trying to make her feel better. And he, and he tells her. You know, I understand where you're coming from. I know. And we don't we don't know anything more than that at this point, but we we know that his parents are not here. Um, so then really quick pan to they are burning the hamburger helper slash 70 year old bodies. Go back to the barn and it's not it's quote unquote night because the night is only like two hours long of somewhat darkness. Mm -hmm, and Danny right. asks Josh for a sleeping pill. She goes to sleep. You wake up to what you quickly establish to be a, a dream. Which is, everybody has left her there. They're in a car, and she's seeing her, again, her family, and they're dead, and um, everybody is leaving, and she is alone. We need to take a second and talk about Witch Baby Soap. I have been a huge fan of Witch Baby for years now. I've been buying their stuff at Monster Mania Con, and I... I gotta say, they make my favorite bath bombs in the whole world. They have a beautiful moonshine lounge bath bomb right now that is just cute as hell. Go check them out. Their website is witchbabysoap.com and you can find them on Facebook and Instagram and everywhere that you like to see beautiful witchy things. Don't waste any more time. Get to your laptop or get to Witch Baby Soap and buy yourself something to treat yourself. We're good. Um, ooh, my whole life is a mashup between red wine and lady in red. And I don't know how it just became a bisexual anthem, but I'm here for it. So her realization that maybe Christian's not the guy for her is the midpoint oh, of yeah. the film. Redheaded girl gets up at night and puts a something or other mm. under bed. It's like a stick figure. A stick figure thing. Uh, but it was a love rune yes. under his bed. And Josh is awake, and Josh sees it, but at this point, Josh is like, go fuck yourself, I ain't gonna tell you shit. So he takes it. The next morning, there is a bunch of, again, weird singing and breaking of wood, and where is all this beer coming from? Where is all this Girl, beer? Girl, I don't know, but I want it. I mean, they are, like, lit on a fucking Monday morning at 9 a.m. They're like, let's get let's get some beer. I, this beer is made out of pure 72-year-old piss, for sure. <laughs> The next morning after the redhead sticks the rune under Christian's bed, we see that Mark and Josh approach Pele as he's gardening. Josh immediately starts asking about whether or not he was approved to anthropologically study the commune for his thesis. And it's been established at this point that Apparently, Christian asked before Josh to be approved, even though Josh made his intentions known way before travel. Pele says, yeah, uh, you've been approved. Just don't use any names or locations. That's fine. Also, you have to share this permission with Christian. Mark says, I got to go take a piss. And he runs off. Christian comes up, says, hey, Pele, what's the status on my approval? And Pele reiterates the same approval thing. And then Christian does this, like, 
backstabbing thing with oh, Josh God. where he's like, yeah, I already talked about the sharing thing with uh, Josh. Mm. Yeah, he already knows. Pele says Maya, the redhead, has a crush on Christian and that she last year in her 14th year yep. was just given permission to have sex. So Maya is 15 seeking out this 24 plus year old man to mate with no the funny thing about it is that he said that she has the pants license Ugh. yeah <laughs> pants license that's Get what in i those pants, call it. babe that's yep. what i'm gonna call sex from now on like you have a pants license then we hear some fucking shrieking in the background and it is oola or oomph or Oof. something Oof. Ulf yeah. is so pissed because fucking Mark pissed oh my God. the ancestral tree and said ancestral tree is literally the spirit of all of their dead. That's like imagining that one man pissed on your entire family's grave site and only one person's like, oh, oof, oof, how bad are you? <laughs> they just put fresh ashes in there. Like you didn't notice that? So then Connie London, they are like, peeved about the dead people they just saw kill themselves and they are just not upset not happy about it and father odd says oh well your boyfriend simon he left but you know i mean he's not dead he's definitely not dead super alive and she's like he would never leave me never and and he's like yes he's gone i love that he's she's like i could have sat on his lap in the truck because his whole reasoning is there's only two seats in the truck to get the fuck out of there and he's like yeah we don't break traffic laws here we just murder our elders who the yeah. fuck do you think we are yeah uh connie storms off with her with her large rucksack then at least father odd says well lunch is in a bit <laughs> so at least lunch is in a bit fucking turd they found in the woods like that's what it sounds like the lunches are in mark's words it's like they try to make it gross human common pubes on it no let's keep going <laughs> Christian is over with some other dude asking how everybody gets their jobs. And he says quickly that it's based on their traits as children. And Christian asks about incest. And he's like, oh, no, we don't. We don't do that. That's very naughty. Danny comes up to Christian and is like, oh, my God, Simon left without Connie. And he like half heartedly holds his ha- holds her hand like a limp dick. He's like, oh, no, that that was so shitty of him. And she's like, yeah, I'm really worried. And he's like, oh, anyway, let's talk about incest. Mm -hmm. And then she, like, walks away. And that's when she finds, like, the cottage where all the women are doing the cooking. And they're making meat pies. And the the one lady, like, puts a cute little apron on her. And the other girl is like, oh, my God, you're so beautiful. And she's like, oh, my God, you're so beautiful. So it's, like, us hanging out. The redheaded chick. Yeah, she's making pussy pies. Maya. So she makes a pussy pie. Danny is, like, finding her home. She like gets into it she's baking with them she's making the meat pie and she's really enjoying it for the first time since she really got there she's actually enjoying herself yeah. get to josh and the elder in like the sacred temple with the sacred text which i believe they're on the 19th edition of yes yeah and reuben is their oracle um yes. and reuben was deliberately born as a product of inbreeding while the elder is like we have reuben as our oracle because he's not clouded basically yeah. the fact that he's disabled actually opens it up up to more of a spiritual realm and then josh is like okay that's all fine and good but like what happens when he dies do you just like wait for another specialized needs person to be born in order to like carry on the oracle and he's like oh no 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 we inbreed in order to get a new oracle every generation yeah directly conflicts with christian's inquiries in terms of inbreeding there is a very silent and very echoey shriek that you keep hearing and all the all our tourist characters hear it and we go to each one of their locales and we hear them hearing it and in my opinion this is you hearing Connie die and yes. oh absolutely uh, and, and you're getting the vibe there is a deleted scene in which explains how de- how Connie was killed what when you see Connie's body at the end of the film which we'll get to she's wearing um a a specific shawl or like um yeah. cloak or shroud and in the deleted scene of the film they're seen drowning a young boy of their own um in that same shroud and she's also very bloated when we see her 
when yeah. she's dead, which is it's a product of being wet. drowned. They genuinely believe that they're in the right. And it's because they're putting up people of their own that it's it somehow equals out in the universe. But this well, entire time also, you are left wondering, okay, is this my prejudice against other cultures right? like that I'm is bringing to the table? Or is this really like just, can I just accept this as another person's way of life? It is beautifully done. We have not had Swedes as the villain since fucking Die Hard. Right? <laughs> but I still stand this cult 100%. I would jo- call me. I'll join you. I will join I you. Let's yep. do it. Well, can we talk about the scene that we're about to get into? That is yes! the period blood and pube scene. So well, we know. So we know that Christian has been like the subject of this girl's fancy. And we've already seen this tapestry that explains the love spell. And we've already seen the rune under his bed and her picking flowers in a way that they've described. And his drink is suspiciously darker and redder that there's menstrual blood in his drink. And then as he's eating a meat pie that was served to him with a wink, he pulls a pube out of his mouth. Mark is the one who makes the biggest stink out of, of this. Of course. He, he catches every instance of Christian pulling this tiny hair out of his mouth, which, mm-hmm. aside from Christian, could have been taken as just a fucking fuzz. Right. But of course, Mark is like, that's a pube. I be I think because Mark is the one who has been so cognizant of the differences in what he's been experiencing, he is the one who's been so easily calling things out. Mark was really creeped out because people seem to be staring at him after he pissed on the ancestral tree. Immediately, the girl that Inga, who has been eyeing him the whole time, and he's like, oh shit, she's coming over here. Oh shit, like she's looking at me. She says, hello, you come, I show you. And he's like, okay, she's going to show me. And he leaves with her without question because <laughs> he thinks he's going to fucking get laid. He goes with her, and then the meal it is over, and we get to the evening. This is a scene, I do have a fun fact, that um, there is talk about in this scene. We see Josh goes to bed, and he's wearing his shoes. And this this actually hit me. I know a, I, I do read a lot about, like, uh, cults and, and serial killers and stuff. It interests me. And I do think that this shot of his sneakers might be a reference to the Heaven's Gate mass suicide in 97. Yes. When oh. the old men were found dead and he was went to bed with his shoes on. And what's interesting is from the place of he is an anthropologist, he believes very much so in what he's doing and his cause, he would almost, one would say, maybe die for what he is interested yeah. in. And that's, that's what makes the fact that Christian was trying to leech off it even more offensive because Josh is so fucking on this. Um, and he he gets out of bed in the middle of the night and he leaves his things there. And, and you're not sure if he's going to run away, but turns out he's going to the room, the the building that, that houses the Ruby Raider, which is the name of the essential uh, Bible. He's looking at this Bible and then he sees a shadow behind him and he sees something that looks like someone got their goddamn dick bit off because there's Mm -hmm. a mark right on their crotch area and he says mark and then all of a sudden he gets fucking plowed in the fucking head. You see someone over him. The person standing over Josh as he awakens in this room has the skin of Mark's face placed on his face. So after the lunch where Mark feels like everybody is making eyes at him uh, and Mark says to Josh, like, do you think this guy's going to kill me? Which is Ulf, who called him out after uh, Ulf found him pissing on the ancestral tree. It's the morning and they're at breakfast and the elders stand at the table and say, hey, Somebody took the Ruby Raider, the book is missing, and there's only, at this point, two people left, which are Christian and uh, Danny. You see Christian, absolutely, and at this point, Danny is disgusted by him. He throws his friend under the bus. He says, you know, that Josh, I if he did this, I do not stand by him at all. I completely, I dismiss him as my friend, basically. At this point, they say that Danny is going to go with the girls, and Christian is going to go to Siv's house. Christian is then taken to a room and we see that he is looking at a drawing of a bear Mm -hmm. on fire. And then from there, he is asked to come into another room. 
beautiful. Oh my god, that art! I, I want it. It is gorgeous. And honestly, what anthropology has has these samples on hand? Because I want this fucking cult. Steagle wall glass. Yes. I want Steagle Glass Factory in Mannheim, Pennsylvania has tapestries very similar to this no. with the blue and white drawings on it. I know because I lived, I was poor as a kid. I think we've covered that. I lived downstream from that glass factory, Steagle Glass, where they used to do those elaborate paintings on glass work. And we would get in our, we had like a little creek that ran through near us. We would get big hunks of green glass that was excess well, ragnar person is also the one who did these drawings again he did these oh drawings shit punk house. that's awesome and then also this dollhouse is the same from what i read this this bunk house is the same as the dollhouse in hereditary it tells the entire <gasps> world. shit he's taken into that room that is filled with the same drawings that he saw in the first room but in replica and he is asked by an elder woman how he feels about maya and at first he's like what i don't even i don't even know this person and then the elder woman says he's been chosen as a mate oh great blaine's absolutely right that during this all happening danny has drank and drinks some dandelion tea to get ready for the quote unquote dance competition of and midsummer dandelion, we mean fucking shrooms yeah well i don't that's the thing this cult obviously has access to some they got psychedelics yeah. because it comes in a lot of forms we 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 have it in the mushrooms. We have it in a lot of tea throughout the film. We have it in powders. You know, this is just a special drink for the competition, as you said. But I will say, I do think these people could run a successful wedding business with less pubes and incest. With oh, all the yeah. flowers they got there. It's a matchmaking so like, thing. It's an app. And then she begins to trip a bunch of balls and she sees her feet growing into the ground like she did in the beginning with her hand. Which, Which PS, is so I think wonderful. Is- Yes, it's a beautiful metaphor for him, her becoming one with the new yes. community. Basically, she's having a great time. She's in full white wardrobe. She has the flower crown on her head. And she is basically introduced to this maypole tradition where they all dance around the pole as women drop out one by one based on how dizzy they're getting through the dance. And as they're dancing, it becomes clear that she's going to be the one who comes out on top. The older woman in, in Swedish, and this is translated, she says that basically she's saying the devil lured them to dance and now in defiance they dance till they fall and the one who dances the longest will win. The one who survives last will be crowned for her stamina, which is interesting because obviously that came up a lot in the 2016 election. Election. And I wonder if that's a nod to this. This was filmed in 2018. For sure, for sure. Um, Danny's gown has two runes on it. One of change and one of eternity. State of, of eternal change is represented on her. During this time, Christian is given some of the dandelion tea, but is also tinged with red. Yeah. And at first he's like, you know, I don't, I don't really want to trip. I don't want to have a bad trip. And the woman who gives it to him is like, no, 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 you won't have a bad trip. You won't have a bad trip. Just take it. Before he takes it though, he sees that Maya has been taken out of the running and assumes her place back in the crowd. He looks at her, they make connection, and then he takes his dandelion tea. I love the way she just like, oh, I can't, falls out. Yeah. And we cut to Danny, who is still in the running in uh, the Maple Queen competition. And suddenly she is able to speak Swedish. I love it. Um, And then finally it's down to just her. And then she wins May Queen and she gets a flower crown. And she's wandering through the crowd as she's wandering through the crowd, like during her acceptance and to her platform where she'll walk. She sees her mother. Her mother oh, walks past so heartbreaking. Her. Yeah, it's like, really can fucked up. Can you imagine? And she says, Mom, and you also see her sister. Like they're all cheering. Yeah. I'll and uh, they pull out a camera from like 1925 and I'll take be- a picture of her. And Christian's just like standing by the maypole like a fucking dweeb. Because he's tripping balls. Like he tripping doesn't, he's thousands. seeing all of this as if it's a movie and he's just following it around. And he knows. When he took that fucking, he was staring at the redheaded girl. He's like, this bitch already gave me her pee blood and her pubes. I mean, 
I might as well take these mushrooms and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, like but he's then, he. We acknowledge that he's in. Like yeah, he's whatever. Get, he's gonna oh, get yeah. fucked because apparently his girlfriend doesn't like sex, so that's a big problem. Yeah, he can just. Ow, ow. <laughs> oh no! I, I hate his friends so goddamn much. He's Except horrible. for Pele. Pele comes up mm-hmm. and just says congratulations may queen and like kisses her full on the mouth and i was aroused oh also he, yeah as they kiss the flowers on her flower crown pulsate oh that's her vulva it's, right it's, pop that poppy girl pop that poppy. Um, <laughs> so um danny is then put on a wooden platform and is lifted up above the heads of the crowd and so she's trying to find her footing and then she does and i swear to god i got pocahontas vibes oh, i was I like know. this is a woman coming into her own she is a queen like yep can mm-hmm. edit if there was not a raccoon and a small hummingbird around there i'm gonna be fucking <laughs> They all sit to eat the May Queen feast or whatever. And somehow she just like intuits whatever she's supposed to do. Um, And while she's sitting in her May Queen throne, you can see that the throne is responding to her. Like all the leaves and everything are, are breathing with her. If you watch the food on the table, which none of these people's food looks appetizing. This is like nope. this is like the most American meal where it's like gross and you're like, oh, there's no salt. It's just fucking pepper and nothing. Oh. Where's the paprika? Where is all the exotic spices? Some garlic salt? But yeah, it and was it, there's also like carcasses. And there's also oh. like a goddess of fertility in the middle yeah. of the table. Yeah, it's a lot of carnal shit going on. <laughs> Of a guard, goddess of fertility, that old lady is fucking fine. That, oh my god! That's always talking and shit. I'm like, you know yeah. what? You is a silver fuckset. She looks like yeah. Madame Pomfrey, and I love that for her. <laughs> well, yeah, Madame Pomfrey though looks like she's the one who would fuck her, and they would and yes. would be on top. Probably. I need that fanfic. Cottage poor lesbians. Cottage Mid- poor. Midsummer yeah. and Harry Potter. Can you imagine the anarchy? Oh, they were one oh, in the same. God. It would just yeah, be absolutely. Dead. Well, and then Christian's at the table, like amongst all this pulsating food, and he looks over at a guy, and he's like, "Excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> what's <laughs> happening?" <laughs> And then the guy just fucking claps, which I would do, but I only have one hand, yeah. right in his face. <laughs> and then he's just like, looks like a puppy dog who was just told oh no. God. And then he goes, why did you Why did you do that? It's like a fucking so circle. Weird. Pele's fucking drawing her again. There's a lot of mirrors in this film. And the table is straight up reflected. Also, yeah. Pele mentions that he only draws people on their birthdays. Mm-hmm. So I think that this is his, him drawing her a portrait today is meant to recognize her second birth yep. into this Ooh, honey. family. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then they try to feed her a herring, and that's kind of gross. Oh, yeah, they're yeah. like swallow it whole, bitch. What movie on Kink.com do you think this girl was a part of that she can swallow a fucking herring whole? She's like, no, then. <laughs> This is when Maya starts giving, like, come fuck me eyes. And he's like, all right, I'm stoned as fuck. Let's do it. Yes. Not only that, but they, like, the crowd creates a path from Christian to the, I guess I'm going to call it a shed. Where Maya love shack. Yeah. (laughs) Wait, I love how Emily says the love shack and I say the fuck shack. (laughs) This is a very good representation. Fuck shack, baby. Fuck shack, baby, yeah. She also gets put into some, like, Cinderella fucking fantasy carriage, oh. and she's like, can Christian come? And they're like, nah, bro. Ugh, go away from him already. Enough. Right. Yeah. Christian alone. Like, yeah. this is your life now. Accept mm. it. I do like that the other women push her in the chariot. So I guess this is to represent the feast and uh, the ritual and whatever. So they end up digging a hole and burying what is essentially representative of the entire feast they had. So it is a stake. Um, there are some greens in there, and then they bury it. Put a little salt on it. Just a little bit of paprika. Christian is taken to Maya in the fuck shed. Stop door dealer! Take a drink, bitches. Oh! Uh, Christian is told to breathe in, basically, Celexa. Um, I said pasta face man gives him aer- aerated Viagra. <laughs> 
Good old pasta face. And then he's taken into a room of naked dancing women who are surrounding Maya, uh, who is also naked and perched like she is ready to accept a penis. So boring. Uh, um, He is disrobed. They begin to have sex and everyone starts singing. The way he stares at her when he begins to penetrate her is the least sexy. It's almost like, imagine how I'm staring at you right now. (laughs) <laughs> this is also a rape scene so although i do want to exclusively yeah. fuck on beds of wildflowers now like i just I, want that out there they're like singing and they're all going in tune rhythmically to his fucking her and yeah, so, they're like moaning and groping themselves to like entice him and like you know goad him on couldn't they have picked like a john mayer song or something this is terrible <laughs> this too is is the representation of what we've seen of like if one member of the community feels something yeah. they all do maya assumedly as the sexual pre- predator in this situation is gaining some kind of pleasure as are the women surrounding her the females seem to appreciate the females the males seem to appreciate the males although as we found out during the suicide ceremony earlier when pain is expressed it's throughout everybody i will say that if i could rhythmically sing when you each had an orgasm that would be cool like if i just call you and i'm like we are one period cycle away from feeling each other's orgasms (laughs) so we cut to danny gets back from uh blessing everything and walks in on Christian fucking Maya and so she starts sobbing and again we we see the women that were taking care of her uh share in her emotional experience by screaming and sobbing and and they all become rhythmic and they're all experiencing this together and I get the twinge of Danny taking solace in that in okay Mm -hmm. i'm not alone in this i've been alone this entire time and these you know these women are partaking in this experience with me it made me feel like i was on drugs and i wasn't but the way that they sob with her is Mm. so deep and guttural it's also just such a good contrast to the way that christian is holding her so half-heartedly when she first finds out that her family is dead Right. Yes. In the beginning of yeah. the movie, how he's just like sitting there near her as she sobs. And then in this moment, she's surrounded by like empathy, finally, for the wow. first time in her life. And I'm so yeah. upset that the only real orgy we get is like horrible. He has not come for like ever. They need to, they need to patent this aerated fucking Viagra. <laughs> and they push his ass into her and they're like, dude, just fucking come already. And he comes and, he, and she says, I feel the baby. You don't know you're pregnant no. for like no, four no. to eight weeks. And you know that you end up rocking on your back trying to get the you know the cream in there like it's just maybe it's part of the ritual or whatever but i don't like it i don't like any of this it's just a really uncomfortable rape scene i mean that's what it is in part of it like her mom is literally like singing to her face i remember when i got pregnant and my (laughs) whole family was there The following ending of the film is basically a full force lunge off of a cliff. So so Christian McOrange Dick, after presumably impregnating Maya, runs out of the cabin because it seems like the the Viagra wears off once you come, I guess. It's like yeah. interest in a conversation. <laughs> he runs out of the cabin and he's like free balling it around and then he sees his friend's leg sticking out of the garden. Not even incognito. Like, not even... No. Like toes, it's like the whole goddamn leg, the whole calf, and yeah. there's like a rune car carved into his foot. So, and up until this point, he thought that his friend stole the book and ran the sacred text and ran. So he sees the leg, and then he bolts to another terrifying shed because that seems like a better idea. Yeah. And then he sees what's his face, the dude from the London couple. Mm -hmm. who is spread out in an iron eagle position with his lungs that are removed from his body and hanging above him, which is how the Vikings used to kill people. And he's got flowers over his eyes and his dick's all hanging out. And the chickens are just like, this is normal for us. We don't Uh, care. Fun fact that Ari Aster did months of research on Viking torture techniques. And what Simon was subjected to is actually right in line with the, quote, blood eagle method. Blood eagle, that's what I was Thank you. And it's a prolonged type of ritual killing detailed in Norse poetry. Norse poetry, and so basically you're you're meant to believe that he is actually still alive because his lungs are outside of his body, but he can still breathe. Yeah, you see them inflate, which is horrifying. Oh, it's it's horrifying, yeah. Also, did anybody else get serious Hellraiser vibes? Yes. Yes! Oh my god, the tearing apart of flesh? Yes. Yes. The roses are also, like, impaled into his eyeballs. Yeah. 
yeah. which is fun. And then the one of the like elders comes in, finds him all naked, looking at their their blood eagle, and he's a little embarrassed. So he poofs some magic drugs into his face, and then you see the guy, the flower crown dude, like bend down and close his eyelids, and he goes, Christian. And then they explain to him that he can't speak and he can't move. So basically he's just like paralyzed within his body. And then he finds himself in the middle of a ritual where uh, Danny is now fucking covered oh. in a mountain of flant flowers. You have seen this cosplay at this point and in your she's life. You killing see- it clean. Airman Gildo Zegna did not immediately make this dress <laughs> after the movie. Something is wrong. It's such a beautiful moment because you, she feels alone still here. She, I don't think she feels really integrated with the new community yet. She obviously doesn't feel integrated with her, her old community at all. Um, and then it shows, they basically explain the plot to the whole film at this point. Yeah. So you have Oracle who is like mm-hmm. scribing in the corner on top of a cloud. Can we talk mm-hmm. about that? <laughs> it has to do with like it's basically their imagination. It's, it's so it's like in the clouds, like their heads in the clouds. So it's like oh, this, their imagination is basically being read by these other people. So these kids are drawing pictures. The elders are are scribing it. They get into explaining how at this ceremony every ninety years they sacrifice what is it, eight nine, human lives. Nine. nine, thank you. Nine human lives. And they, they express that they've already sacrificed the two that, that committed suicide earlier off the cliff. And they're also dressed up like scarecrows um, and, like, stuffed with fruit and shit. A fucking Zoom meeting in hell. <laughs> oh, my God. This is going to be my new Zoom background. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so they're dressed up like spooky scarecrows, but, like, also a bunch of fruit. And then they explain that they've already sacrificed some outside and that now two of their own have volunteered. So Ingemar's one of them and then another one's just like a villager or whatever. And then they play this weird game of like torture rune bingo. It's an bingo. homage to the lottery. Yeah. So it gives me Hunger Game vibes, but I'm here for it. Yeah. Shirley Jackson shit. Amazing. Marry me. Do we drink for my crush on you? Can we do that? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I've been drinking this whole time. Like nobody's this. All, I'm all about all of the wine. Pele has this like gorgeous, massive, I have not a flower crown, a plant crown with like ferns coming down because he not only brought new blood, he also provided the new May Queen and he's just like super proud and I'm here for it. It's really cute. Also, yeah. like, I think uh, this is also, like, maybe a pagan reference to the Green Man. Beltane, yeah. Beltane, um, Beltane, it, it, thank you. Yeah, it's the Green Man from Beltane, which is the um, joining of the Green Man and Mother Earth, which makes total sense with um, Danny being the May Queen and covered in flowers, and then, you know, Pele being obsessed with Danny this entire time. Um, he would represent the green man and also fertility is a big deal in uh, Beltane. So she, boom. she's so tiny covered in all these flowers. It's just really crazy. I'm like, she's how does she stand up? up? Well, later right? she's going to walk and she could barely walk. And I'm like, you guys plants grow in the ground. Let's not take them too. Okay. They didn't hurt anybody in your cult. <laughs> but her <laughs> like anguish in this scene among the flowers mm-hmm. is just uh. Amazing. So, so they reveal that you that she now has to choose between the bingo lottery loser or winner, yep. depending on how you look at the scenario, and uh, Christian, who is still um, totally paralyzed uh, and sitting in the wheelchair. And I love this so much. Oh, oh my god, you know, it's beautiful. Her. But it also represents how Danny has felt her entire relationship with him. She could never really open up to him. She could never yeah. express who she is. She could never. She never really had her own autonomy. And, and I think that <laughs> in that moment, you don't know who she's going to pick. She's either going to pick a village or a Christian. So she ended up picking Christian. And you find out because you see the really terrible mummy corpse of the London girl. And Ugh, basically she's stuck in a fucking scarecrow. And um, inside of a, of a house, um, there's a guy teaching children how to remove the guts of a bear and they put Christian inside this bear suit. It's a real bear's fucking body. And I mean, damn. It's yeah. where we met in the beginning. And yeah. like, it's, it's a very bear. crudely cut. Christian placed in the bear skin. Um, we cut to people wheelbarrowing bodies toward this building where everybody's being brought. So we see 
the, all of the outsiders who had been killed up to this point. And we see that um, Mark was the loser of Skin the Fool, which we mm-hmm. referenced earlier in the film. Um, which So he has a jester's cap on and everything. And they are all placed in, very strategically in the building. We see that Christian is banished for his wickedness. There's like this whole scripture thing. It alludes to he did the May Queen wrong. I, I, the sentence says, with you we purge our most unholy effects and may you reflect on your wickedness. Um, so then he's placed in the shed in the middle with the other bodies. And then finally the shed is lit on fire. So they're speaking in Swedish and he says, take from the U tree, Y-E-W tree feel no pain and gives like a cotton swab of a psychedelic to one of the tribute and then does the same to the other and says uh take from the yew tree and feel no fear as the yellow building burns because this is the yellow building that they alluded to like nobody can fucking go in there this rob zombie version of the hills are alive music playing and <laughs> two men are burning alive and smiling at each other and screaming as they burn alive And I mean, people, as everything's burning, the people outside, and also, does anybody else have any issue with, like, the continuity of how many fucking people are in this cult? Because there (laughs) goes from 10 to, like, 75 to, like, 100. That's another thing I love. And then the people start doing exactly what they did with Danny the, the, when the women were crying with her. They're all shrieking like they're being burned alive. This is the moment where I'm like, motherfucker, I'm going to need to watch some Great British Baking Show after this to get over the <laughs> Disney or something. <laughs> Danny crawls away in her 247-pound Oscar de la Renta flower gown. I just want to say, as the people are all acting and screaming, this mentally for me felt like an amalgamation of every Michael Scott improv there's ever been. <laughs> Literally, I'm just like, everything where he's like, I have a gun. (laughs) Everybody is empathizing um, with the sacrifices in the building. So they're screaming, they are writhing on the ground. And Danny is really just struggling to breathe from the smoke that is coming from the building at this point. She gains more control of her breathing. She stands up, looks at the building, and it's a beautiful long shot of her going from wonderment and scared to a very small Mona Lisa grin. Yes. And that's where the movie ends. And all I wrote in my notes was justice, peace, witchcraft. What? Wow. If I may say, my theory yeah, yeah. is that if you watch in the beginning, there is a lot of nuance to the flowers and a lot of the, the things of the May Queen in the room of Danny's family. There's some thought that essentially Pele, who is buttering her up and saying, you know, welcome home and I'm so glad you're here, is basically the one responsible for not for killing her family to eventually get her here to be their May Queen. So that's my theory. I can't decide what I think is foreshadowing and what I think is plot points. That's fair. Mm -hmm. So like when you see the flower crown on the photo, that's either a clear indication that a lot of this was preconceived or it's just really, really well done foreshadowing. Yeah. So I, the entire time, like like the members of the film, I don't know how to distinguish reality from fantasy. I, I think it's smattering of both. I think there definitely was a lot of planning on Pele's part. I genuinely don't think um, her sister or parents had any uh, say in this. And I do think that the drawing that Pele made, he was basically... Like, yeah, this is our May Queen. Um, She's, Mm -hmm. you know, vulnerable. She's underappreciated. She's perfect. Um, She's abandoned, basically. So she's great for, um, you know, accepting a new family. There were a lot of signs. I mean, everything was foreshadowing at the beginning of the movie. There's a lot of uncertainty about the frequency that they do this ritual because they're saying right. they said 90 years, but then you're seeing that there's a May Queen every year. And I know, Emily, you have some good math. Pele, when he talks about his family being burned, we, as we said, that they were in this ritual that they volunteered themselves. So my guess is that there's there's a specific equinox ritual for each season. They occur at 90-year interval, intervals, but I do think that probably every year you have a May Queen. Like, it's, not, it's probably not the entire ritual of the sacrifice, but you could mm-hmm. still have that festival. And also, if everyone ages out at, what was it, 72? Yeah, yeah you're um, going to need to do more than nine, every 90 years. 
right. It has to happen every year of everyone that turned nine or 72 that year. So I think maybe, maybe it's like when it aligns with, cause the obvious, they also spoke about specific breeding. So they might breed people so that it times that you have a male and a female or two tributes, quote unquote, that are of age every 90 years. In reading about this, as Ari Aster was writing this movie, he had gone through a really bad breakup. And this oh, whole okay. movie is basically a getting a sense for this is her ending this relationship with Christian and moving on and getting closure in whatever way that is. And that's like, I love her- that. And Ladies, that, make your man watch this movie in front of you. And if he thinks that Christian <laughs> was done dirty, leave him. What an epic person to take, like, I got broken up with or I broke up with someone to let me burn a human alive in a bear He's suit. a fucking oh. genius. I like that he had the wherewithal to understand that he needed to make the protagonist for such a film a, f- a woman. Mm-hmm. because there's no empathy for a dude being broken up with. There's yeah. none. <laughs> like if a white dude was like, I feel marginalized, I'd be like, oh, fuck yourself. No, you don't. Yep. Mother is still one of my favorite movies, and people hate that movie more than anything in the world. Once I see a movie like this, I'm like, to Reddit. Like, I need yeah. to just read someone else's opinion on it. I need to understand more about it and the less I learn in my adventure the more I like the film I always tell Doug I can't tell him whether or not I liked a movie until 24 hours after because the amount of times I've thought about it since watching it is how much I like it that's true what's a litmus out of flower crown out of flower crowns I give this eight out of ten flower crowns because like Emily, I really enjoy a movie that I can sink my teeth into and really tear apart analytically. So this was Christmas um, yeah. watching this, but you know, this was like my third or fourth time watching it. So I was able to dig a little deeper and draw my own conclusions. And I love that it's basically a vaguer ending and a lot of questions were left unanswered. The reason it didn't get a full 10 out of 10 is like Emily always says, it, it has to scare me. And while there were some jarring moments in the movie, it just, I wasn't scared. Um, it was very interesting. It was very occult, which I really enjoy. And I think it's definitely, you know, Ari Aster is doing a lot to shape what horror looks like in the 21st century. But um, in terms of scaring me, no, sorry, I had to pass. So I give this movie a nine. I love this movie. I do. It did scare me. And I think because it hit me on personal levels, I have a really, really big fear of burning alive. I don't know why. I don't know if that's like how I died in a past life or something, but like it was a nightmare I had all the time. Maybe it's because like I knew as a child that my dad was a firefighter that like that just got into my head. But that those scenes still haunt my nightmares. And like for that, you get an A plus. It even haunt my nightmares. Good for you. I was disturbed by the imagery. I was disturbed because I think every woman can identify with Danny because, like, I had a relationship like that. Yeah. Like, I almost married a guy like that. I I was very, very close to marrying a guy like that. My only complaint is that I wish I knew more about the cult. I want want to know everything about them. I want to know how long they've been around. I want to know... Um, why all of the members um, seem to be white when they obviously do introduce POC at different points in time. I want to know why they have Nordic along with Viking, along with like pagan witchcraft. I feel like there's a really interesting story there. And if there's not an interesting story there, I'm disappointed. You know, I know you guys have listened to Office Ladies, but like there is a character book. There is a show right. book that yeah. has everything it. spelled out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm right there with you. I just, I know he has it because he is that great. And I right. want to know everything about it. So I am going to give it uh, a 7.25. I almost went a seven and a half, but here's my reasoning. I use movies as a way to, and this is just a personal thing. I use film as a way to escape from the things that scare me in the way that I can't mentally handle. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, this movie, I watched it. Now, it didn't scare me, jump scare, you know. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was was creepy as fuck. I mean, there's there's organs out of a body. But Mm -hmm. what really fucked me up was the weird sense of calm, the, the, the drug use, the lack of control, the really just feeling like, 
this girl was so alone and sad and scared. Also, the idea that, just to even imagine, like, your parents are dead, and you are alone, and you are in this place, and this is happening. To me, this movie just, it hit me too deep. If that's a complaint that I can have, took me to a place that I actually felt like I needed to do something to feel better. What I love about certain kinds of horror, even with Psycho, even with, you know, classic horror films, I love a good whodunit. But what this film did was it took a Wicker Man meets a Children of the Corn and it <laughs> fucked it 10 ways to Sunday. Fabulous. I think it was done well. It just was too heavy for me. And I would not want to watch it again because it made me think too much about things that scare the shit out of me. You have to be a masochist to enjoy this film. Yeah, thank you so much. And that I think Stephanie brings a really good POV to this in that, you know, Emily, you and I are like, <laughs> yeah, fuck me up. <laughs> and we are so depressed. Yeah. Oh, God, no. <laughs> We're like, it makes you feel something. <laughs> and and Stephanie is is here for a good time. She wants to enjoy something that, you know, I think a lot of horror viewers uh come for, which is I want to escape reality. I want to be afraid Mm -hmm. of something that is totally ridiculous and I know couldn't happen in real life. Mm -hmm. And so when you are met with something, and we talked about this, Ari Aster could very easily be a drama filmmaker. Yeah, I think the the way Blaine phrased it is absolutely correct. Like, how many cons do we go to where people are just like dressing up like Ghostbusters? It's just a good time. But and this I, is not a good time. I appreciate the mastery it takes to make somebody have those feelings hours after they've watched something. And I will say that that's something that Blade didn't do that. Frank and Hooker did it, but in a funny way. <laughs> I think there's something to be said for the movie that you'll watch only once. If anyone uh, experienced um, feelings of anxiety or depression or feelings that you can't really decipher at this moment, um, please, please, please seek out um, mentalhealth.gov. There's also the suicide hotline. If you Google it, you will get a great resource where you can also instant message someone uh, who will help you immediately. There are so many resources and there are so many people who love you and who want to see you thrive and um, feel good. And we are one of those people. Um, So- great friends like we have because that's the thing if your friends are not there for you when you need them fuck them find somebody better (laughs) come hang out with us drink wine out of a mug that's why we're here and we love you and you matter and you're important absolutely love you